Flawless skin is a thing of beauty. We coddle it, we nourish it, we try to improve it, but then we often refer to it as only skin, misunderstood and undervalued. Our panel examines dermatology. The doctors are on call tonight. I've got you under my skin. Funding for On Call is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call, starting its 11th year of opening doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, Regional Health, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. Hello and welcome to On Call Television. Tonight the topic is dermatology, all about the skin. The skin is the largest organ protecting all the other organs within. Interfacing our bodies with the environment, the skin protects against invading infections, conserves water when we're in the desert, cools the body when we're hot, holds in heat when we're cold, produces vitamin D from the sun's rays, senses the tactile world around it, and is integral for the cosmetic needs required for finding a mate with whom to reproduce. There are many internal illnesses reflected by the skin, such as the green color of liver failure or the butterfly rash of lupus. Obvious skin conditions include rashes from allergies, infections, dry skin, as well as skin cancers from malignant melanomas, basal cell and squamous cell cancer, and so on. This field of medicine is huge. It requires a great deal of knowledge, much of which is purely visual. The field of dermatology has many subspecialties to include Mohs surgery, a field of surgically removing cancers of the skin and at looking at the biopsies under the microscope to determine when it's totally removed. Our guest tonight is a Mohs surgeon and a general dermatologist and is especially prepared to answer your questions. Uh, Dr. Jim McGran is originally from Watertown, had his undergraduate training, graduate school, and medical school at USD. His dermatology residency training was first at Marshfield Clinic and the University of Wisconsin, and then Mohs training at University of Wisconsin with Dr. Frederick Mohs himself. He moved to Sioux Falls and started Dakota Dermatology in 1997. Dr. McGran has been a frequent guest on our show because of his common sense way draws many questions from you, our audience, and it is your questions that make this effort helpful to many. Please pick up your phone, call us at 11, I'm sorry, 1-888-376-6225. That is 1-888-376-6225. Your questions make uh, this an informative uh, show for all of those listening. You could also email us at questions at oncalltelevision.com. Welcome, Dr. McGran. Thanks, Rick. So you did first two years of med school at USD School of Medicine, and then your second two years? Oh, I actually, I'm one of the four-year guys. So You're one of the very yes. first four-year guys, weren't you? 1977 was the first year that University of South Dakota went to a four-year school, and then the second year they opened the doors, and then they came. So I graduated in 1978, the second year in the uh, USD. Yeah. Um, and uh, and what made you decide to go into dermatology? It was one of those things where. Um, I think in dermatology, you get to see babies one day old, 
and patients 113 year, 13 years old. Uh, you never see the same thing twice. Most of the people that you see, you can help, and uh, it's just a very, very uh, rewarding field to be in. Uh, and I've been doing it for 30 years, and every day somebody walks in with something I've never seen. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's just great fun to do. Yeah. Now, I said that it's mostly a visual thing, but it's a tactile thing too, isn't it? Well, that's one of the important things is that when I talk to med students, I tell people this is a chance to use all your skills. You can look at things, you can smell things, you can touch things, but what's quite interesting is very frequently when the patient comes in to you, they'll describe something to you that when you look at it, you kind of look there and go, I don't see it. But then when you get a little closer, you can say, well, maybe it's there. But then when you get to actually feel it, you can say, yes, they feel things that you don't see. And so dermatology is very a tactile source, too. Yeah. Yeah. So a uh, Mohs surgery, that's, that's another thing. I, I'd never heard of it except one lecture at Emory, and a, a gentleman removed a skin lesion, that, and he had to keep moving until he had removed half the skin of this, the, the temple of a person, and then the, it all healed eventually, and he let it by natural uh, healing. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I, it stuck in my mind, and then along comes Jim McGran, and, and he's a Mohs surgeon. Tell us about Mohs surgery. Fred Mohs was a surgeon at the University of Wisconsin who was tasked as a med student to find a way to cure skin cancer, which seemingly at the time seemed fairly simple. They said, put a stain on there, show us where the cancer is, and we take it off. He actually found, rather than staining it, he found a way to map out the cancers and remove it. And I went there as a, as a medical resident to watch him do the surgery, and after about a week I was uh, just amazed at the skills of the people working there and the things they were can do, they could do. And he sat down one day and said, Jim, you have to stay. And, uh, you know, the opportunity to work with someone as wonderful as Fred Mose couldn't be passed up. And the, the real issue was I realized that if I came back here and practiced dermatology and didn't know how to do this, there would be a lot of people who weren't served. There would be things that I couldn't do and people that would go with cancer that would be uncured. With Mohs surgery, we can cure about 99% of the patients, and so it's a fabulous technique. But it isn't something we use on everyone. It's for the more advanced cancers. And that's, I've been seeing people doing more Mohs surgery when I, did, I don't think it's not necessary. Let me to ask you that question. I mean, see, basal cells carcinomas are pretty, I mean, I take care of them in my office uh, time and time again, and they do. It, they well, you know, that's an important point because Mohs surgery is a technique for advanced cancers, and the huge majority of people who come in with simple skin cancers can be very easily treated by their primary care doctors, the family doctor, internal medicine, and derm general dermatologist. Um, I find that the majority of them I can simply go in and remove with a simple surgical technique, and they get a good result, and the cost is reasonable. But there are a substantial number that have advanced cancers or areas that are a problem, that's where the Mohs surgery comes in. But it, it is an issue and that, you know, you look at it and say, when's the time to do Mohs surgery? And, and you have to use some common sense on that one. So, <clears throat> see now, not only are you a dermatologist as a Mohs surgeon, you are a surgeon, but then you are also a pathologist because you take a little bit more and then you go look at it in the microscope to see if you got it all right. That's right. So one of the things about being the, the Mohs surgeon is that you're the whole package. You, you're the doctor that does the surgery. You're the doctor that identifies the cancer and determines when it gets done. And then when you're done, you're also the doctor who's going to repair it. When Dr. Mohs started the procedure, he didn't repair anything. He left everything open. And it was a wonderful uh, benefit for me to see how the wounds will heal without any closure. But those poor souls would ever, several times uh, take years to heal. And one of the really interesting things about it, at the time I was doing the surgery, I was working with plastic surgeons because in Europe, the plastic surgeons are the Mohs surgeons. And in the United States, it's usually dermatologists. So we taught the plastic surgeons how to learn dermatology. They taught me how to do repairs. And so nowadays, when we finish the cancer, when it's clear, we repair it. And so 
you know, people traditionally think of plastic surgeons doing flaps and grafts, but the reality is we routinely do those procedures. And I think we do it uh, pretty much as well as the plastic surgeons. And then I've also seen you, in some cases, call in the plastic surgeons. Yes, there's no question that you have to learn where your places are. And we, we are lucky in our community. We have fabulous plastic surgeons. And they are inventive and wise and uh, can often help you. You know, we also are lucky in Sioux Falls in that we have some wonderful oncologic surgeons that there are sometimes the cancer Can gets cancer beyond surgeons. the skins, yeah. And there are times when the cancer will go into deep into the nose or into the brain. And, you know, I can go in and get the skin clear, but there's times when it's going through the bone and into the brain. And then you say, wait a minute, buddy, this is the time to pass it on. And we're lucky enough to have those wonderful surgeons in Sioux Falls now. Who can do those things. Yeah. Well, let's dive right into questions. I mean, uh, we can go anywhere and everywhere. Uh, actually, the first question was, does baking help uh, fake baking help with eczema. Fake baking is the sun tanning. Basically tanning booth. And uh, I wouldn't recommend it because you have to look at it and say for every treatment should the benefit outweigh the side effects. And the issue with tanning with a, with a uh, tanning booth is that you're using a source of, of light that literally damages the skin when you do it. And so there's no possibility of using it without damaging the skin. And while tanning booths have a little bit of UVB, which would be beneficial, what comes in as the negative is that the majority of it is ultraviolet A, which is a strong damaging light that penetrates deep into the skin and injures the tissue. So, you know, if, if you were in an extreme situation where there was no other option, you might consider it. But luckily in this world, I've never encountered one. Let's talk about eczema. Uh, what is eczema, actually? Well, eczema is basically injured skin. You know, the skin acts as a barrier. If you if you didn't have intact skin, all the things, the chemicals, the things that you come in contact with would literally kill you because you need that barrier to protect you. So right. eczema is essentially when that skin becomes injured and it can be injured from dry skin, just plain old uh, losing the oils. It can be injured from solvents, cleaning agents. It can be a physical injury. It can be chemicals. But essentially what happens is the skin loses its barrier function. It starts to become inflamed. And in England, they call it eczema in the United States we now like to use the word dermatitis but they're synonymous it's it's just inflammation I mean eczema is inflammation of the skin from a variety of variety different of causes. sources and so it can be a number of different causes the most common cause I'm seeing right now is hot water dry skin winter itch uh, paper, guy told me today this is so crazy he said my wife wants me to look you to look at the, my back and I pulled up the back and there are spots of where he's been scratching he's got dry skin exactly. and his wife has been scream uh, putting a lot of cream on there but he says i have to tell you I really love the hot water. It makes me feel so much better, And uh, but boy, maybe that's what's happening. Well, you know, I can identify them with because I get up in the morning and I don't wake up till I climb into that shower and the hotter it is, the better I wake up. But each time when you do that, you're washing the skin with that hot water, you're defatting the skin. And the outer layer of the skin has a barrier function and there are oils there that act as a barrier. And when you're using soap and hot water, you're stripping that oil away. And you think about it when you wash the dishes, if you use cold water and soap it works okay if you use hot water and soap it works better well when you jump in the shower and you're washing with a strong soap and hot water you're stripping all that protective barrier away so you know in the best world you know bathe in a reasonable way use lukewarm water uh, don't use a strong soap uh, but there's a lot of people like me that kind of wake up that way so uh, when you're a sinner like me you have to you have to repent and so the way I <laughs> repent is when I get done with that shower, I climb out, dry off, and while that skin is still damp, use a moisturizer. And in the old days, that was something that was heavy and greasy, and nowadays, we have some of these wonderful lubricants that can moisturize the skin without being heavy and hideous. And what would be a really good one? I mean, I just told somebody to try, this same guy said, try something heavier like Aquaphor, which is, you know, Vaseline. Basically. Well, you know, and when I started, Aquaphor was the tool because that's what we had. But Aquaphor is heavy and greasy and frankly hideous. And so one of the issues is if you give somebody something like that, it works, but it lubricates your skin, it lubricates your, your, Sheets, clothes. your clothes. It's <laughs> difficult to put on and you don't feel real comfortable. So what's wonderful is now modern products that have ceramides, which are oils that are very light 
have the benefit of they'll go in and they give you that barrier function, they repair the skin, they put the oils back, but they do it in a way to where when you get done your skin's not greasy. So an example of a ceramide would be? Well, the, the ceramides, there's a lot of different products. And so one of the old fashioned ones is the Aveeno Daily Moisturizer, wonderful product, inexpensive, about 10 bucks for a big bottle. The Aveeno? Newer, yeah, Aveeno, an old fashioned, but there are about 20 different kinds of Aveeno, so it has to be Aveeno Daily Moisturizer. One of the new ones, and actually the number one selling moisturizer in the world today, are the CeraVe products. And CeraVe is a, a new company that came in and they, they brought out this lotion that's very light, it's very elegant, and wonderfully it's inexpensive. And then some of our old friends have kind of jumped into the bunch, and a lot of us have used Curel in the past, and now Curel has a moisturizer with a ceramide, and Cetaphil has a moisturizer uh, with ceramide, and your old friend Aquaphor is now going to change. They're going to have a ceramide in their product. So they'll still have Aquaphor, but they're coming out with their own ceramide-based product because they were losing the parade, and they were realizing, by golly, these guys have something. So ceramides Ceramide, are the secret. That's a real yeah. take-home message. So you can find it on the on the show. Go to your pharmacist and say, "Hey, I need a ceramide-based moisturizer." You spell that with S E R C E R A M I D. C E R A M I D. Ask your pharmacist. Yep, yeah, that's it. Ceramide. All right. Wonderful product, and I guarantee if you try it, you'll never use Eucerin or Aquaphor again. All right, great. Psoriasis is a common skin condition that causes skin redness and irritation. Most people with psoriasis have thick red skin with flaky silver white patches called scales. In 2008, we visited with a psoriasis sufferer in Minnesota. It's worth watching again. Now, obviously, you mentioned to me on the phone that it's embarrassing to have to deal with a skin disorder like this. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, I don't know if your camera can catch it, but uh, um, when I sweat or anything of that nature, I get red blotches all over. Now by tomorrow morning, where my glasses go across right here, yeah. that will be solid scales. Mm. And right in here, where it's starting to be red, that will be completely all scales. And that's gonna be sore too, right? And it gets very sore. And it itches. And you try not to scratch it uh, but that's what I said, try. He, he, I put as much stuff on it as, I put stuff on it four or five times a day. You had talked, or before we started taping, you had talked about some of your sort of coping mechanisms and one is that uh, with your sheets, you take special care there. Yeah, um, before, uh, a couple of years ago, I used to buy just the regular plain old sheets and uh, when you climb into bed, my back is totally covered with psoriasis patches this big and I put uh, ointment on that three times a day. And like this shirt, you can only wash them so many times and the ointment goes into the fabric and next thing you know, it's ruined. Mm. Um, I go to bed, and before I go to bed, I vacuum my bed with one of these little hand busters to pick up the uh, psoriasis, and sometimes in the middle of the night, because of my moving and so on, and the scratching, um, I have to get up and, and vacuum it. And not only that, the ointment, that I've got on my back would get into this sheet and it's hard to vacuum the 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 crumbs of, of the psoriasis out and it, it, you just got a heck of a mess. I have changed sheets every two days and I use sheets that are 380 count per kale and you know they run about 70 bucks a whack and they last three weeks. Now what, somebody wa that's watching this that doesn't have psoriasis and doesn't know anybody that has psoriasis, what, what's important for them to learn from our visit? They don't understand what it really takes, the, the trips to the doctor, the special things that you have to have for your clothing. Um, 
the availability just to be in a public spot where you can feel comfortable being able to talk to a person like you. And I th think that you're thinking, ooh, I don't want to touch that. Yeah, ooh, uh, that, that. what's wrong with his arm? Yeah, exactly. Is he dirty? Yeah. You know, and that, that is a, a, a question I have been asked. What's the matter? Don't you watch? Oh. And that... Uh, uh, That's got to that, hurt. It's hurt. It, 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 it does hurt, but uh, the people that have no idea what psoriasis is like, watch this tape, please, and you'll find out that it has uh, an extremely debilitating mental as well as physical effect. David, thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome back to On Call. Tonight we have Dr. Jim McGran with Dakota Dermatology as our guest. Please call in your questions about tonight's uh, t topic of skin, 1-888-376-6225. You can also email them at questions at oncalltelevision.com. Well, th thank you uh, for that wonderful interview. Mr. Vanderslice uh, did that uh, five years ago. I think you were on that yeah, same show. Yeah. You, you, uh, your heart goes out to him, you know? Well, it's horrible. So let's talk about psoriasis. What is it and what causes it? Well, you know, psoriasis is an inherited condition. It's a genetic aberration, and essentially there are six different places in the human genome that can go a little awry. And what happens is that there's a protein in your white blood cells that sends a signal to the skin, and it makes the skin grow more rapidly. Psoriasis, in essence, is skin growing fast. A third of the people not only have psoriasis, they get arthritis associated with it. So it's a, it's a horrible disease that uh, in days gone by was miserable. There were things you could do, but you couldn't cure it. Sometimes you couldn't control it. Today, the majority of the people, there's a lot we can do for them, and uh, it's all a matter of finding out what works for them. Um, you know, if you watch TV today, everybody will say, well, you need to take a biologic. And biologics are wonderful tools, but they're very expensive. And so, uh, you know, this is one of those things where if you go to a dermatologist, you'll find out there are options that don't require the very expensive tools. And, and uh, there are light treatments, there are oral medications that can work well. Uh, with Mr. Vandersloos, I mean, his life was a disaster because of the amount of work he had to do. And had I had the opportunity to sit down with him, I'd say, you know, there's a lot we can do for you that doesn't involve that much work. And that's an issue. People with psoriasis become physically worn out with the effort they have to put into it. I, um, I really think the, your, your suggestion of uh, using methyltrexate it's a treatment that we use for people who have rheumatoid arthritis. Something like 60% of the people with rheumatoid arthritis can be controlled with methyltrexate alone and st instead of having to go to the biologic. It's the same story with psoriasis? Well, you know, with, with methotrexate, you have a very inexpensive generic drug that can be taken on a weekly basis. A huge majority of these people get excellent control. It will take that psoriasis down to the point where they don't have to use topical medications. They can sleep the night through without itching. It will take away the pain of psoriasis. We used to think it would relieve the psoriasis and turn it off, but it may not do all of that but it definitely reduces the discomfort of psoriasis, you know, the arthritis component. And it's a, ter it's a very inexpensive medicine, and as long as you're a compliant patient, it's a good tool. Uh, you know, it's an amazing thing. You, you can imagine that those people were called lepers before. I mean, Well, they, you know, the actual Greek word for leprosy is psoriasis. You know, the, the Greek word leprosy uh, is psoriasis. So you can say uh, the, the Greek word and you're saying leprosy and psoriasis. It's the same word. And, you know, when we talk about biblical things, what they may have been describing in the ancient biblical times may not have been leprosy. It may well have been psoriasis. Well, and you know full well that this is not an infectious illness. You can't catch it. It doesn't, uh, it isn't something to be ashamed of. It's not your fault. And everything that uh, Mr. Vanderslice spoke about was exactly that same point. Oh, it's a, it, it's a, you know, it's a very social debilitating disease because when people look at you, they say, I don't want food served by this person. I don't want to be touched by that person. This is a diseased person. He's, he's ill. I don't want to touch him. And you know, today we can help those people. The, um, the fact that a third of those, or a percentage anyway, do go on to have arthritis, it's a very debilitating uh, 
condition. Well, you know, it's a condition that uh, can really, you know, you can take a person who's suffering and miserable and just barely getting through the day and you give them the proper treatment and they're back functioning. Yeah, and that's a wonderful thing to do. Yeah, that's, uh, that's it. Uh, we have a question from Sioux Falls. My friend picks at lesions on his forehead. Any suggestions about helping him stop? You know, picking. Let's talk about picking lesions. Well, picking can be one of those things where sometimes it's their hobby, you know, and so uh, I think one of the most difficult things dermatologists have to deal with is people who are obsessive pickers because uh, it, it may be their way of relieving stress, it may be other things, and so the first thing you have to do is you have to make the patient aware that you're doing this. And you say, do you want to get better? Well, then there's an issue here. You have to learn that this behavior is causing your problem. And so we'll give you tools to heal what you have, but we can give you the medicine, heal it up, but if you keep picking, you've got a problem. Um, there are medications that can be used, but a lot of it is self-awareness. And you know, uh, if, if you understand what, that you're doing it, then sometimes you can be smart enough to say, well, I'm gonna pick a different behavior. We're gonna pick a different behavior. I had a patient, well, this happens a lot. They'll have a skin lesion on their forearm and they'll scratch it and then it becomes more inflamed and therefore they pick even more and it's the picking. The problem was long gone. Now the only problem that's left is the, their picking. Oh yeah. What I like to do is I tell them, you know what, you can't pick anymore, but you can rub all you want. So I say anytime you have an urge to pick, take a little bit of salve and you can rub because rubbing won't injure your skin, but picking will. Yeah. So you've got to change that behavior. Do you give them a particular salve, a triamcinolone? Or well, a you know, I'm, I'm a cheapskate, so I'm always going to start out with the initial injury. I like to use the triamcinolone medication because it comes in 55-gallon drums. And if you look at the price of dermatology medications today, they've gone sky high. And things that used to be 10 or $15 today can be two or $300. And so you have to look for generics on this thing. And, and triamcinolone, when it comes in 55 gallon drums, is about uh, $25 a pound, which is about that much medication. But when you use these things, you have to bear in mind that Creams are wonderful for taking away irritation and things, but they don't heal. And so many times you're gonna to have to combine things. And so one of our favorite tricks is to take a cream and mix it with an ointment. Ointments are heavy, they're not very elegant, people don't like them. Creams are nice to use, but they don't heal you. But if you take the two together and combine them, you create an emollient, and now you have something that's reasonably elegant to use, it doesn't cost a fortune, and it's gonna heal that skin. And that's a big tool in our bag. Do you, um, do you have them mixed? by a special pharmacist or do you just have them mix them themselves? Well, the pharmacist can mix it because it's a real difficult skill. You take this, you take that, you slap it together and mix it. You so it. you don't really need five years of training and once in a while we still have to remind them that you still can turn the wrist and you don't have to count everything. Um, and I've actually had a few of the younger pharmacists say that can't be done. Um, I trained in a place called Marshfield Clinic and they used to prepare it in 55 gallon drums so that it was readily available. But it's a wonderful product, it's inexpensive and it saves a lot of money. Uh, do you need to be concerned with freckles? Please address what to look for. Well, I think uh, freckles are basically a cosmetic issue. They have no potential in the average person to cause any illness or anything, and they're simply a genetic uh, pattern that are often, if you're Irish or something like that, there are rare conditions where freckles do play a role, and, and uh, you know I can get into that, but that's really not practically an issue. People will get brown spots in their foreheads and their side, uh, and their temples in particular as they get older. Sometimes those are they can turn to cancer. Well, and people call those freckles, but they're nearly not freckles. They're what we call lentigo, and they're an area of pigmentation that in the vast majority of people are benign. In many cases, they're, they're cosmetic. And these are things that if they get to be significant, the dermatologist can take them away with freezing techniques or light peeling lotions and their products like that. There are cases where as people get older, you'll start to see color changes. And so skin can turn into cancer. And so lentico can turn into melanoma. So if you've had a brown spot that's changing colors, well, then you need to show that to your doctor. There you go. I have a few dark brown spots on my scalp and neck. Some stay for years, some, some stay for years, some go away. Should the spots be removed to make sure they don't get any worse? Does every dark spot that turns color 
turned into melanoma. And that's kind of what we just said. Same old thing, you know, if it's one color and it's not changing, probably okay. If there are colors there that are multiple colors, if the colors are irregular, if you look at it and you're scared, you better get it checked. What do you think of the A, B, C, D, E, you know? A, uh, it's, it's a good tool, it's a simple tool because the A, B, C, uh, D says, well, if, uh, if it has A, it's asymmetric, the, the moles are irregular and we're showing a picture there. If the borders are irregular, that's worrisome. That's the B. And then the C yeah. is color, and if the colors are variegated, it's that's variable. worrisome. Yes. The D was something, we needed a D, and so we said if it's bigger than six millimeters, which is kind of like the tip of your thumb, well then it ought to be investigated. But you know, common sense, we know that small lesions can be melanoma and big ones can be benign, and so we're sort of getting away from that. But I've always been kind of a sneaky guy, I like to add an S to that, and so I always tell people, if you you've got a lesion and it has a shadow, in other words, that sharp edge isn't there and there's a little shadow to it, that's worrisome and that should be checked. All right. Here is from Sioux Falls, which causes itching all over without a rash, driving them crazy. Tried OTC lotions, have decreased showers, uses cooler water, um, male in my 70s. Well, typically what this individual is running into is the initial stage of dry skin. Before you have a rash, the barrier function starts to go. When you lose that oils in the skin, you don't have barrier anymore, and now the skin is gonna start to burn and sting, and typically in us guys, that's gonna be the lower legs and occasionally on the arms. And so the way you have to fix a problem like that is you have gotta repair that barrier. So what I tell people is, when you get out of the shower, you get out, you dry off, and immediately while that skin is still damp, get your moisturizer on. Now you won't get rid of the itch and the burning immediately, but if you do that faithfully, that will solve that problem. And that's when you do the ceramide. Use the ceramide based lotion because it's elegant to use and it'll work well. But that's the first sign that you're drying out is when you get that burning sensation. You'll see that because your skin will burn an itch before it has the rash. Okay. How do you know to remove a, a, a skin lesion? I mean, that's, that's a common question. We just talked about it, A, B, C, D, and S. The qu what's the characteristic of, let's well, say, a malignant melanoma, basal cell carcinoma, squamous, squamous cell cancer? Quickly. You know, basically you start out with the simple things. If you've got an open sore that isn't healing, you gotta okay. check it. If you've got a lesion that's changing color, it looks funny. If your wife or husband looks at it and says, honey, that doesn't look good, that's good enough. You know, it only takes a little bit for your doctor to look at things and say this is okay and it isn't. But I can tell you that I have a lot of wives uh, whose husbands are alive today because mom said, dad, you You're go in ahead. and see the doctor. <laughs> and they came in and they had a melanoma or something. Skin cancers like basal cells and squamous cells frequently are that open sore that doesn't yeah. heal. There you go. This person has a wart-like lesion. They came back to, uh, if she clips them off or uses a wart remover, uh, they don't hurt. Any suggestions? What about warts, quickly? I mean, well, warts are one of the things that God gave to this world to keep doctors humble and patients frustrated. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you know, they... Um, I agree with you on that humility thing. You know, I mean, they're, they're just, warts are difficult to treat. There's never a, a simple solution. Um, we freeze them off, we burn them off, we laser them off, we use topical agents. And, you know, sometimes it takes all and, and the other above. Patients will come in to me and say, Doc, you got one shot, and I just tell them the door's over there because I'll do my best, but I can't promise you that I'm gonna be able to treat them in, in one session. What do you think about duct tape or an upside down uh, banana skin uh, clip? I mean, I've had patients great success with banana skin and duct tape. Well, it, it's one of those things, it's basically a, a, a social type thing, and it's called placebo effect. Um, I, trained, <laughs> I trained at Marshfield Clinic, and we had these wonderful old dermatologists from Germany and they would pay, bring patients in with warts and they'd take them into the x-ray room and they'd put them on the table and then they would bring the light out and it would have this big fancy light on there and then they'd go in the room and they would turn on a fan and make a noise and then they would come out and announce to the patient that wart will be gone in three weeks. And they had about an 80% cure rate but the reality was they did nothing. They did no treatment at all. Now you and I can't do that. That would be malpractice. Yes. But, but the issue is something else. So, something can work. And you know there have actually been studies shown that uh, you know um, people that can do uh, um, uh, appropriate types of things like uh, 
putting people uh, suggestions work well. And so grandma saying, I bought that wart and I'm gonna bury it, that might work. If the person believes it, it can work. Yeah. And, it, and I mean, it's, it doesn't hurt anything. A dead cat so in a sack yeah. at moonlight. What's wrong with trying it? If the person believes it, it works. Um, duct tape was a wonderful thing. Uh, we tried it, we thought it was something good, and uh, uh, we had a few successes. So we, we stayed with it for a while, and then much to our amazement, we found out it doesn't do anything. Tagamet. Uh, Tagamet was the same thing. There's theoretically a benefit, but in reality, it just doesn't do much. How about skin tags? They're not warts. They're just all these little things growing on the underarms and the necks of people who are maybe sometimes a little overweight. Well, you know, 88% of us get them, but if you're a little overweight, you're going to get more. And we, we feel like this is kind of something that maybe God's going to give us a little camouflage. Because as we get older, you start growing barnacles <laughs> and you start growing skin tags and, you know, say, why me? But the reality is this seems to be related to a hormone from the bowel called epidermal growth factor. And as we get older, our body secretes a little more of that hormone, and that stimulates the skin to do these things. I'm we can blame the bowel. Yeah, we're I've blaming not the bowel. Heard that one. I'm waiting for a word from God to tell me why. You know, <laughs> I mean, why do we get these things? We don't know. I just uh, clip them off with uh, scissors and then control the bleeding. What do you do? Well, insurance doesn't cover it, so I'm going to do the thing that will get the, the process no done. Uh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Be a great idea, but it doesn't work. No, what I do is uh, they aren't covered, so I, tr I treat them with liquid nitrogen because I can do it quickly, and uh, I don't charge for it usually because the insurance company won't pay for it, and, and it's a good service for the patients, yeah. but uh, if they can put up with me doing it, it works well. Yeah. Once in a while, somebody comes in and I have to sit down and spend 20 minutes harvesting. Well, then you're going to have to pay for it yeah. because mother insurance company does not. not cover it for skin tags. Dermatitis herpetiformis is part of uh, uh, celiac disease, and what's the treatment? Well, this is one where the best treatment is, is a gluten-free diet. And uh, gluten is a protein in wheat, and if you can actually uh, school yourself to get away from that gluten product, gradually with time it'll go away. Short term, we'll what use... what does it look like? Well, it's usually little blisters on the elbows, knees, and butt. And that's how the doctor sees it, or a dermatologist. You walk in the door and you got little bumps on the elbows, bumps on the knees, and bumps on the butt. That's dermatitis herpetiformis. We diagnose it by doing a biopsy, and underneath the skin, there's a certain immunoglobulin A that's present there, and that's the diagnosis. Short term, we'll use sulfa drugs, and it can be controlled with that. Um, but you know, the best treatment long term is gluten free diet. Uh, and ceramide, uh, those lotions are made. Are there available everywhere? You go to your pharmacist and ask about them because they're wonderful products, and just about every pharmacy carries them. Another dermatitis herpetiformis from Gary, South Dakota, Millbank. Uh, lubricants for the skin, simple baby oil, are there uh, okay, effective, aloe vera? Well, you know, baby oil works. All of these things work. The issue is, is it something that will be hideous to keep on? And so I tell people, if you like to use baby oil, there are a couple of hints, and that is no fragrance. And so, you know, babies should never have anything with fragrance because fragrance not only irritates the skin, but it's a possible allergen. And so if you want to use baby oil, that's fine. But remember, you're not moisturizing with oil. You're trapping water in so if you want to moisturize the skin get the skin damp put the moisturizer over it and if you're going to use baby oil use it after the bath not in the bath because if you use it in the bathtub now you're going to get up slip and fall and then you get to meet a neurologist yeah so <laughs> yeah so <laughs> yep. baby oil outside the bath let's talk about baby issue of diaper rash i see that as generally canada or manilia well, the primary thing isn't the manilia. The primary thing is the burn from the, from the urine. And so what happens is if that urine is on the skin too long, it physically injures the skin, you break down the barrier, and now you've got yeast in the stool, so now you get a yeast infection. So when you go to the dermatologist, they give you this combination of medications. And typically what I do is I use a steroid that's going to repair that barrier, and then I put in a yeast-type medication with it. So I've got something to repair the barrier, something to take the yeast away. 
give it to them, heal them, and then get it off it, you know, because one of the things with these medicines is as soon as the skin is healed, your goal is to protect that skin. So you heal the skin, then you come back with a barrier, and then I'm back with my ceramides. I really well, like, like to use those. like the ceramides over the zinc oxide ointment that I've used. Well, work. zinc oxide works, but it's real tough. And if you've got a mom who has to put that zinc oxide on, you know, it's uh, hard. I mean, it's hard. You, know, you can't think, get it off. Think about catching a pig and greasing them every day. And, and if you said, gee, what if I can put put on a lotion that I can spend 15 seconds doing it and then I don't have to put a diaper on a greased pig. That's you know, that's not deal. a nice thing to say so. about babies, but <laughs> the reality is ceramides don't leave the skin greasy, so it's so much easier to put a diaper on there than it is with zinc. Okay, we, we're, gonna, we're not going to be able to get all these questions. Let's keep going. Huron, is there anything new for itchy scalp or dandruff? You know, itchy scalp is a frustrating thing because we have great tools, but insurance companies don't like to pay for them. And so, again, it gets down to where when the skin is injured, you need something to heal the injury, but it has to have that emolliency. So when you get into the scalp, you need a vehicle that's going to work well. So what we like to use are these foam-based uh, cortisones. And so what happens is the foam-based cortisone takes away the inflammation, puts a little barrier in there that heals the skin and yet you don't walk around looking like you just put the the beeswax in you yeah. know um, <laughs> but the reality is most of the insurance companies want to use a lotion or solution or some kind of a gel Prime and those actually lotion. well they don't work well because a lot of times they're not repairing the basic problem and so when you use a gel or a solution they take away some inflammation, but they didn't heal that injury, and Selsen, so they don't do well. Selsen shampoo? Well, Selsen's a cleaning product. So I tell people when you're using Selsen or head and shoulders, you're cleaning the dandruff off the scalp. But when you do that, you're also irritating the scalp. So what I tell people, if you need to use one of those products, that's how you clean the scalp. But if you want to repair it, you're going to have to use a shampoo that's going to heal it. That's a tar shampoo. So tar shampoos actually will take that away and you know they may not smell that great but there's a one real nice one called tea gel it's a very elegant shampoo it has a little tar it actually heals the injury lubricates the skin a little bit and that's a good over the counter you, one you can buy tea gel over the yeah. counter that's good wa bay lots of moles in my arms moles moles what do you think about moles remove it leave them alone well the issue with moles is what do they look like uh, the average person has about 35 and so the only benefit to taking off 35 moles is i'm richer and the patient's poorer so you know <laughs> yeah. so what are we going to take moles off we're going to take a mole off if it looks like cancer or it's worrisome. If it's rubbing against clothing or creating problems, we'll do something like that. The third thing is it's got awful. I don't like the look of it. I want it off. Well, that's cosmetic. We're happy to do that, but the insurance company is not going to cover it. All right. Fine keratosis, is it different than psoriasis? Well, a keratosis is, is skin that is thickened, and it can come on uh, as a result of a sun damage. It's a precancer. It can come on as, as a, what we call seborrheic keratosis, which is literally thick skin, and it's essentially skin growing thicker. Psoriasis is skin growing thicker in a plaque, but it's brought on by an inflammatory disease, where a seborrheic keratosis or an actinic keratosis are brought on just by changes in the skin itself. All right, and that's that classic rash here and on the eyebrow. Well, that's seborrheic dermatitis, and so that's a okay, little different thing. And uh, the seborrheic keratoses are those little plaques that those are. Those are the back. old barnacles that kind of that mark barnacle. you as a geezer. Yeah. You know? And uh, <laughs> we're all moving that direction. Um, seborrheic dermatitis is an interesting condition. Oh, it's a it's along the nasal labial folds and the eyebrows and mustaches and. Right, and this is the time of the year when you start to see it because you get that red, waxy, crusty areas on there and it gets in the eyebrows, gets on the face, can, can get in the ears. Well, what does a guy do about that? Well, you know, it's very easily controlled with hydrocortisone. So you can take a hydrocortisone lotion, use it once or twice a day for a while and it comes along very well. Uh, there are some shampoos that work real well. It's one of those diseases that responds beautifully to treatment where we doctors haven't done any research because why spend money on something that's easy to fix? Well, a little bit of hydrocortisone. Yeah, ba but basic old hydrocortisone lotion. Okay, but the problem is is that it also is treated with powerful antifunguses in people who have HIV who have s terrible seborrheic dermatitis. Well, you know, the medicine that they use there, ketoconazole, is an interesting medicine because it kills fungal things, but it also has an anti-inflammatory effect. So 
in those particular people, you're kind of using a double-edged sword because it actually can treat psoriasis, can treat inflammation, and it gets rid of that infectious but component. We, but, so there could be a variety of reasons for seborrheic dermatitis oh, yeah. and you don't well, know. Well, and you know, there are some conditions where people have genetic disorders where they have zinc deficiencies and other things like that. So, you know, if you've done these things, it's not responding, that's the time to go talk to your dermatologist. So person talking about a rash on their hands, I've got a patient who seems to have a terrible thick rash on his palm and his family all have it. What about a palm rash in a family? Well, it's called psoriasis. Um, the huge majority of these people who come in and have chronic hand rashes like this and the doctors use the medicine and they do other things and the vast majority of the time we'll find that that individual has psoriasis and what's interesting about psoriasis is it can manifest in one area. It can be in the scalp, it can be on the feet, it can be on the hands, it might be on the elbows, it might be in the armpits but very often it shows up in the hands and the reason why is think about where you use the areas the most. Your hands are constantly being used, abused and whatever yes. and when you injure areas you'll often get psoriasis to show up there. So if a person talks about warts over their hands, or they, there's a lot of people who have a lot of little wart-like things as they get older on their, their forearms. What's that? Well they're usually what they call seborrheic keratosis and you know dermatologists like to keep people at an edge so we call them stucco keratosis and a lot of times when you look at them they're those little white powdery looking things on there and you look at it and say well should we freeze all these off? Well if you want to make me rich you can do that but this is again where lotions work well and so I tell people you can go to the store, you can buy a moisturizer that will have a little salicylic acid or has a little lactic acid. And again, one of the ceramide products comes with both the salicylic acid and a lactic acid. And yes. you can use that and it will moisturize and peel those down. That's a great thing. Operating uh, from Colton, uh, operation by taking cancer off a lip, uh, but it won't heal. Why won't it heal? Lip Lip cancer is removed. There are lots of answers to things like that. And the, the, uh, the issue is, A, the cancer might not be gone. The second thing is the medicine the doctor gave you to heal, you might be allergic to it. And so, uh, you know, there They're are some different some answers there. there. They might um, be allergic. And then the other thing is sometimes there's little sun damaged areas that weren't treated. So you, you really need to check with your doctor on that. African American skin, there's a visibility of scars on African American skin. Anything you can do to reduce the visibility of those things? Well, you know, the issue with, with African American skin is when it's injured, it hyperpigments. And so it, it's not so much the thickness often, it's often the darkness. And so the, what you do there is you bleach. And so there are hydroquinone medications that you can use on that. And up until very recently, there were a lot of those around. But uh, over the last couple of years, there's suddenly been a, a problem with manufacturing and so the last two or three years the hydroquinones have been hard to get and they're just coming back on the market but if you have that uh, that's something where your doctor can help bleach that down. There's uh, peels between the fingers very itchy there's a lot of people who have this asteatotic eczema between the fingers little blisters what what is that? Well it's called dishydrotic dermatitis that's and uh, that's a problem where there's a couple things that can be going on a lot of times this is the guy who's in there washing with soap and water and they don't rinse that soap away so they're still leaving some irritants there and what I tell people is whenever you're washing with soap you're in and out of soap make sure you rinse those hands real well get that soap off there and then when you're done get on a good moisturizers there are certain people where they're actually getting eczema and then that's a different situation you got to help them there's another population there like typically the hairdressers and things and they can often get enough injury to where they actually get infection. So they can get yeast infection, they get other things, so can be work related. One minute left, uh, repeat the medicine for psoriasis and another a friend with psoriasis committed suicide. How can we address the emotional needs of those people? Oh, it's a huge issue, but I, but I tell people we've, we've got help. We can do things for you and one of the interesting things is sometimes people need some of these really powerful drugs and one of the things that we have had is a number of these drug companies have, have a soul and they will provide medications for people who can't afford it. So but the methotrexate is inexpensive. Methotrexate is very inexpensive and for the, huge, for the average person it's a really good tool and the only thing I tell people is you can't be a booze hound and take a methotrexate. Uh, five seconds cellulite. What's that and what did you do for it? It's fat showing in a regular pattern and we can pray for you. There you go. <laughs> uh. <laughs>
The flu is all around us and there are some who would like to take advantage of your discomfort by offering treatments which do not work. If you see these flu claims on an unapproved product, it indicates that it might be fraudulent. Here they are. Reduce the severity and length of flu, not true. Boost immunity naturally without a flu shot. Safe and effective alternative to flu vaccine, no. Prevents catching the flu. Effective treatment for the flu. Faster recovery from the flu. Support your body's natural immune defenses to fight off flu. There are no legally marketed over-the-counter drugs to prevent or cure the flu. There are legal products to reduce fever and relieve muscle aches, Tylenol, congestion, decongestants, other symptoms, throat lozenges. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Flu vaccine, that's it. 2012 behind us, our thoughts turn to romance. That's right. We're entering a time of year symbolized by none other than the flu bug. Did you know flu season usually doesn't peak until February, sometimes even later? Why take chances? It's not too late to get vaccinated because stopping the flu starts with you. This job can make a guy humble. My 99-year-old patient was suffering from uh, developing blisters, also called vesicles, all over her lower legs, along with intense itching, redness, swelling, and drainage. After discontinuing every unnecessary medication, I treated the possible allergic reaction with a non-sedating antihistamine and steroids. When she didn't get better, I reviewed blisters and once again realized how many causes there are for blisters on the skin. Let's start with the viral infection herpes simplex type 1, also called fever blisters or cold sores. These large blisters cluster around the face and lips and commonly pop up when the immune system is weakened by a cold. A very similar viral blister or vesicular condition is called herpes simplex type 2, but this one is sexually transmitted. These blisters happen in the genitalia of men and women and reoccur in a similar mysterious way as the sister condition called the cold sore. Anti-herpes medicines do help both conditions. Another blister condition, herpes zoster or chickenpox, also a viral infection and a cousin to herpes simplex, presents like a teardrop on a rose petal or a small vesicle on a red base. Once established, zoster can set up shop in the nerve and raise its ugly head many years later along the distribution of that nerve with a condition called shingles. It's fortunate that vaccination for the young or those over 60 prevents or reduces the severity of this often miserable condition. Blisters happen also from contact dermatitis when, for example, an allergy to nickel or poison ivy or antibiotic ointment develops and that trigger comes in contact to skin. We also see blisters pop up when unprotected hands are traumatized by raking the yard, burned by grabbing a hot pot handle, or frostbitten on a ice fishing expedition. A life-threatening blister condition may also occur when a person has an allergic reaction to some medicine or even an infection and blisters start spreading over extensive amounts of skin and into mucous membranes. Stopping this culprit medicine or providing urgent medical uh, measures, an antibiotic, whatever, can save a life. My patient didn't fit any of these scenarios, however. I realized two other mysterious blistering conditions called pemphigoid and pemphigus might explain this, so I made the brilliant diagnostic move to consult an expert he biopsied the rash, nailed the diagnosis of pemphigoid, treated with clear, uh, and tr cleared the blisters with just the right medicine, and my patient had relief. The more I learn, the more I am humbled. And uh, you may remember that patient whose lower legs were, uh, were really blistery and inflamed, and I sent her to you, and you made the nice diagnosis, and I went, I knew that there's some more cases of that particular diagnosis oh, yeah. of pemphigoid. Very common, you know, and it's one of those conditions where it's sort of like you think about the old one horse shea. As people get older, parts wear out, and the immune system does this. You know, the immune system has a part that helps you and a part that hinders you. And as you get older, sometimes that helper side starts to slip, and the other part starts to come in. And so, uh, 
uh, bullous pemphigoid is one of those conditions where the body's immune system is actually attacking the skin. And so what we do is we kind of cool down that side that's attacking the skin. And a lot of times as the years go on, the balance comes back and you can take them off the medication. So it's kind of a common sense thing. Yeah, well, and you know, uh, she got a whole lot better after she saw you. It's just a wonderful thing, Jim. <laughs> I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Well, this brings us to the end of our dermatologic show. I sincerely thank our studio guest, this, Dr. Jim McGran, a Mohs surgeon with Doc, uh, Dakota Dermatology in Sioux Falls for helping answer all the wonderful questions from our audience. Never had as many questions as we had tonight. Next week, On Call will again be live here in the studio answering your questions about all things dealing with adoption. Get your questions ready. Be sure to join us then. And don't forget to visit the website BeWellSouthDakota.com for great information and suggestions that can help you improve your daily lifestyle. That is BeWellSouthDakota.com. And a closing thought from Michelangelo. What spirit is so empty and blind that it cannot recognize the fact that the foot is more noble than the shoe and the skin more beautiful than the garment with which it is clothed? Well, until next time, stay out healthy out there, people. for On Call is provided in part by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call starting its 11th year of opening doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, Regional Health, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation.